Hello everyone, I'm Professor Margaret Rogers Van Koops and welcome to Journey into an Unknown World. Today I've decided to use the topic of assumption. You know, assumption is something that we're used to doing because we collect information and uh, we believe that information to be true and then we justify, rationalize, excuse and explain ourselves in terms of what we assume is facts and often we find ourselves in situations where our so-called understanding is misunderstood by other people and of course when we try and talk it through and explain ourselves we often find that the person listening is actually not hearing it in the way that you hope they would so how is assumption a negative? Well, the truth is, we all want to be right. You know, when we're talking about something we know something about, we always try and put ourselves across as the authority figure. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who resent that because they don't like someone else telling them what they're supposed to do. And in that sense, we'll be fighting you, resisting in some way. Katie Kamara and I have been talking about dysfunctional families. And uh, what I've noticed over the years in my profession, which is a very long one, by the way, today was my birthday and I turned 79. And uh, to me, when I look back over my life, I can tell you with no no doubt whatsoever in my being that there have been many, many times that I've been in a state of assumption where I believe that whatever I was talking about was accepted by family members, associate members and so on, who would in some way assume that my skills and abilities as a paranormal therapist was limited in some way by my not always telling all that I know but of course there are times when one instinctively knows that a person is not ready to listen to us and yet we assume wrongly that that person is going to be open to everything that we say as soon as we open our mouths and of course if they resist by saying that's not my belief I don't accept what you're saying we feel as though we've been discarded, cast aside as unimportant. And this is often a big issue with couples because they really in some way believe that their point of view is right. And when they come up against the other half who has a whole different idea about things, often um, you know, conversations lead into quarrels and quarrels can lead into violence. Unfortunately, we are by nature violent. And if we believe that we are being cast aside, not understood or loved for who we are and for what we do, then we find ourselves feeling very forlorn, very miserable, very upset and very alone. And once we start wallowing in self-pity, we begin to justify, rationalize, explain in some way ourselves away to other people who might be sympathetic to our situation. And here the sympathetic person may well see you in a different light as well. So that when they try to help in some way, they assume that you're ready and open to listen to advice that they have to offer. And of course, when that happens, sometimes people are taking offense that someone is interfering in their business and uh, will put up a barrier in some way, uh, suggesting that you leave me alone. That, of course, turns us into a, a more uh, insensible uh, state of awareness where we justify, rationalize, go into our pros and cons, of all the things that have happened to us in our lives. And uh, of course we want to explain ourselves away to validate that we are really hearing things in the right way and are sharing our information 
in the hope that someone will learn more about us and be uh, helpful in some way to our own personal issues and problems. So what am I saying here? That often people who have a big sore, as it were, in terms of being discarded, forgotten, cast out, um, often make a business of reaching out to people who are likely to be helpful. One example is coaching or counseling. Um, when a person is paying a lot of money to have someone help them, the person who is helping them may well be very genuine and being uh, very open and receptive to that individual. However, when it comes to the counseling part, um, there is a barrier because the person who's seeking guidance and help is really not seeking the truth. They're seeking comfort. So stop and think about when you're in those miserable moments and you just desperately want to unload all of your pain and suffering to someone who's sympathetic, empathetic to your scenario and you cause hope that they're going to say, poor you, uh, I really understand and uh, I'm here to help you deal with this issue, uh, break out all the issues, show me who I am, where I'm making mistakes and so on. But as soon as any advice is given in terms of trying to understand and share with that person, the insights that a coach counselor has may be in some way rejected because that person feels that their coach counselor is not understanding them, not supporting their moaning and groaning about whoever it is they're complaining about, and so often feel dissatisfied when having some advice given to them. I can clearly say that over the years, as being a, a minister, a counsellor, hypnotherapist, psychology, psychiatry, all the things that I do and much, so much more, that I have had many people come to me and say, I've spent a fortune with a coach, something like $3,000, and uh, I haven't in any way gained any awareness, no satisfaction whatsoever, and I'm very frustrated and very angry that I've spent so much money and uh, I've got no help. And here I want to say that it's important to realize that if your mind is so heavily focused on assuming that this coach will give you the exact answers you want to hear is in itself a negative that prevents you from listening with an open mind. An outsider's point of view can be insightful and very helpful if you have an open mind. But if you're expecting them to just confirm how wonderful you are and how bad the partner is that you're having complaints about, then a coach can often find that the person complaining is not receptive. I can tell you that as a medium and a healer over the years, I have had many people come to me expecting spirit guides to give them all the insights that they need to sort out a relationship. And of course, spirit guides will do that. But when a person is negative and uh, in rejection of accepting anything that their partner, children, family members, work colleagues, the list goes on, are in some way not accepting the client, then the client expects the counsellor coach to have all the answers to all their problems and tell them exactly what to do. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? But when a person tells you what to do, does it mean that you hear it in the right way? I know that when I'm counselling someone, I will often use uh, an example of an event with someone else that's similar to theirs so that we take them away from their own issues so that they could look at a, a, a problem that is not their own and ask them in this situation what would you advise and usually you find that that person will have answers and will say 
what they would do. Now, if they're talking about being uh, negative in the veins of I would lecture them and go on at them and tell them this is a hundred time that uh, I've told you that you're doing this and it hurts me, uh, whatever their scenario is, um, it compounds the bad relationship and turns it into a worse relationship because the person listening will hear it as you are assuming you know me and I know you don't know me very well because everything that comes out of your mouth is critiquing and you have no idea why I've been the way I've been. One of the hardest things to explain in Assumption is that Prince Charming will have all the answers to all princesses worries and problems. Of course Prince Charming has no more order, uh, uh, no more idea than the princess about who she is and what she wants done. And likewise for the man who's Prince Charming he may assume that his little loving princess who needs saving is actually a roaring tiger who critiques everything they try to do to help that partner be happy only to find that time and time again they are critiqued for uh, something they've done. Some things can be quite honestly um, accidents shall we say. You know people do things without thinking things through and a person who is blaming and shaming will pounce on that and say you always do this. Now universal statements are the first thing that's going to upset someone else because when you say you always in some way they are going to collage every critique you've ever given into one big one that says you're no good, you're useless, you're hopeless. And if you stop and think how you feel when the inference is there that you are not the perfect partner, it is so destroying. I've seen many marriages, gay and straight, fall apart because of the hurt that each individual is feeling where they are unable to discuss their feelings but rather come up with emotional threats. If you don't do A, B and C, then I will assume you don't love me. If you don't understand who I am and what I do, then I assume you don't know me. If you don't uh, ask me questions and show an interest in my work or my private life, then I assume that you don't care about me at all. Now. The person that's saying this may well be say, thinking in their certain way how they want to be addressed so that they feel loved and comforted and safe. But unfortunately the more they cast stones at their partner, the more the partner assumes that they are not good enough for them, for this person they love. And so they feel their heart and soul is being destroyed. What happened to my beautiful princess or my beautiful Prince Charming? Why did this monster emerge that I didn't expect to see? Why aren't they being the person that I imagined they would be? Now I want you to hear that, imagined. So let's go back to honeymoon scenarios. Boy meets girl on beach. They're away from home. They're free of any home ways and means of living life. And so they're on holiday, they're going to have a great time and uh, no, no red flags, no, nothing in the way and you think, oh this is Prince Charming, this is my princess, I'm going to carry her off into the golden sunset. And you assume that this love is strong enough to put up with all the potential horrors and terrors of married life. So what is a horror? Well, it could be that the one you love suddenly gets ill and thereafter is never able to work or able to do the things they used to do. Now they feel insecure and they try to explain that they can't do what they used to do. Well, the healthy partner is thinking 
they're making excuses, they're putting more weight and problems on me and I'm assuming that they are assuming that I will do this for them so I will, I'll take over. Now when we take over we think we're doing the right thing for the person we love and we're doing the right thing for everyone else um, around us that's involved in the situation. And then all of a sudden we find out that the person who we're originally targeting to help is suddenly reaching out to other people and taking more information from them. Could be outside family, it could be a, their own coach, but whoever it is, it's a different person with a different input, either supporting them in their misery, poor you, I know how you feel, your wife or your husband is such and such, and uh, I've seen this happening. And so we now are looking at, we've drawn someone else into our situation who is also assuming by the observations that they've made. Now observations are not necessarily clear observations because sometimes we will see something and then assume we know all about that person just by the few things they've been talking about and we try to help them in some way. Well, you could do this at work, or you could do that you know, at work. Or um, if you want to deal with your families, you could do this and do that. And we seem to think that our best friends, or mum and dad, or someone in the family has watched uh, the marriage fall apart, and therefore have some advice in order to save the marriage from falling apart. Unfortunately, once the family gets involved, all these different points of view are flaring at the opposite member of the marriage and uh, they're feeling inundated with critiques that demoralize them even more. And with all the demoralizing that goes on between wife, husband and family, it becomes a battleground. A battleground is awful. Everyone like children are bis misbehaving because they've got no grounded, clear models to watch and listen and learn from. The family are maybe older generations who grew up with a different point of view of raising children. So they could be interfering in how you're rearing your kids, telling you you're not doing the things in the right way. Uh, they may have their point of views about religion and philosophy and uh, you may have married someone outside of that religion and therefore there are plenty of views about how bad that is or how you should adapt or depending on what you're expecting. I had a couple once that was one was a Christian one was a Jew. I asked them what they were going to do. Are they going to embrace religions or they're going to mix them up and share both and attend one another's services and see what goes on in the church in the synagogue and things like that. And the immediate response was, I'm, we're not going to deal with, with religion. It's not important to us. We are going to just live our life the way we want to. Sounded good. They sounded positive and so on. Time went by wife came back. She said, I'm having a real hard time with my husband's family because they're on about we should be going to the, the Catholic Church and uh, I'm not. I'm Jewish and I don't have an affiliation with that. And the more they go on about it, the more I feel like crying and screaming and upset. So I asked her, I said, why are they trying to take you into the Christian church and she said well I'm pregnant and they want my baby to be brought up as a, a Catholic and I said well what do you want she said well obviously I'm Jewish I want to um, have my child educated and be a Jew so I just looked at her calmly and I said how about allowing this child when it's born to go to both and make up their own mind oh I couldn't do that why not well, my Jewish faith says this, is that, that, okay? Well, uh, how is that wrong for you, for your husband? Well, he says, Jesus, this, this, that, that. You know, I don't believe in that because your Jewish faith doesn't accept uh, Jesus as the Messiah. Okay, well, what do you accept? Well, I don't know. I don't accept the, the uh, Christian faith. Okay, so you're saying you want to bring up this baby as a Jewish baby. Well, no, not really. I, I'm not sure what I want, really. 
and the whole session went on like that until ultimately I said to her, you know, everything that you said when I've said something back, you have made excuses in some way to not solve the problem. And it is a problem until you come up with an answer. You obviously don't want to go to two places to learn about religion philosophy, so how about write, read some books? Well, the short version of all of this was it caused a lot of arguments to the point where they were about to separate. And yet again, I sat with them and I said, OK, do you love one another? They both assured me they do. So I said, if you love one another, do you have forgiveness in your heart? And they looked at one another and said, well, I don't know. You know, he says this and this, and she says this and this. And I said, well, if you hold on to history and you hold on to the things you were taught as a child, you'll never mature. You'll never get over this issue because you're still doing what your parents have taught you to do. You, sir, are still going to the church and you're still going to the synagogue. So what do you want to do about that? Can you just leave it be and you both do that and leave it alone and let the children decide what religion they want by taking them to the different places? Well, they agreed on that and they left and I didn't think about them much. A couple of years went by and uh, yet again, I got a call. Only this time, it wasn't to ask for advice. It was to tell me that they had both decided to become Buddhists. So I said, well, that's a good idea. What drew, drew you to that meditation, relaxation, um, talking about the middle road? And before long, they were able to communicate. They'd sorted out all their problems. The family were like, what are you doing being a Buddhist? And they just separated themselves from the family so that the family couldn't interfere. What did they do? They, mo they were living like two blocks away from their family. When they uh, separated, they moved house to another town. And that was their freedom they needed to stop and say, who am I? Who are you? How are we going to talk and what we're going to do? And so they'd come back to me, not for advice on how to handle their marriage, but how to handle their parents, who were assuming they were lonely without their parents, who were calling up all the time um, to want to know how they were doing in their new house, and were they buying this, and were they buying that, and were they doing this, and so on. So I said, do you realize that your parents are telling you by calling up and doing all these conversations with you that you are actually gone from their lives, you've left a big hole and they're miserable. So they're trying to draw you back. Oh, well, I can't talk to my mother, I can't talk to my father and excuses like this came out. And I said, talk is not what they need. They need you to listen to them. And even if you don't agree with them, to be able to say, I hear you, I'll think about it. That's all they need. Because by that, that you're saying indirectly to them, I still love you, you're my parents. Well, they applied that to their parents and I'm happy to say that they let me know on a phone call that they had smoothed over a lot of their problems and their children, they were expecting another baby too, so uh, their children were going to be doing fine. And uh, everyone had agreed to not interfere on what religion the children should be. But guess what? They were bringing the children up as Buddhists. So the, the growth here was very important for everyone to understand that all the assumptions had gone out the window but just by making new decisions to do things in new ways so that each individual could in some way say, I've changed, I've transformed, I'm not the person I used to be. I can tell you in all honesty that uh, my children have grown up with a lot of assumptions. I've had three marriages and they were all difficult in different ways. And so adapting and this is something I want to address because when parents get divorced, the children are thinking that maybe they'll never see their dad or their mum again. 
and the assumption is they've been abandoned. But it doesn't necessarily mean they have. It means that circumstances were difficult for the parents. They couldn't maybe find the money to get on a train and come and visit. Or maybe they'd been told by some of the other members of the family, don't you come near these children and so on. But the children don't get told these things. And a lot of times the children grow up thinking their one parent that's missing doesn't love them or doesn't care. But the truth is that if they were to come back into a style of life that they've walked away from, where they wouldn't fit in, they know that they would be derogative to the relationship of the children, so they stay away. And then the years pass and the children grow up and they have children and they go out of their way to try and avoid being like the person who's absent. They bring the children up according to the parent who is with them. And that means they bring in the parents of the mother or the father to support them in some way. So now we've got a genetically child created by two people now being reared by one person who is doing their best, no critiquing here, um, doing whatever they can under their religion or whatever other things works and so on and while all that is going on there is seclusion in the nest as it were because everybody is agreeing but by the time the children grow up they have points of view of mother and grandmother and grandfather and no input other than what they've heard from those people about dad because dad's never turned up so dad was no good dad was drinking dad was doing this dad was doing something else and the children come to conclusion their dad is not so bad no uh, it's not so good rather now um i had reason to work with someone a while back who a uh, gentleman who had just that he listened all his life to his father was no good, he was a drunk, he was always out and about, he was never home. He also had an awareness from his mother that his mother was a nitpicking person who would often reprimand him as he grew up in different ways and could see that there were times when he wanted to run away from home. And so coming to me for a session, we had a lot of deep talks and I pointed out to him that as he'd wanted to run away, so his father had had the guts to run away or the means to run away from a woman that was driving him crazy by nitpicking all the time. And I asked him, I said, does anyone else in your family nitpick? And of course, immediately he said, well, my grandpa and the grandma do quite a bit. So I said, okay, they see that they brought up your mom, and so your mom is looking for the same things your parents are looking for, and you don't even know what your father's like. You, you've only got their word for it. But what you have within you is the DNA of your father. Well, again, you know, people come and go with me, and I don't retain everything that they say because I do what I can, and as a minister and a doctor, they're info is secret so I don't talk about it and I don't try and remember anything so several years went by and I'd forgotten the name even and then uh, my name was jogged by the man and okay so we did uh, an appointment on the phone and he told me that he'd found his parents and uh, that he'd lived with them for a period in time and he'd realized that many of the things that his ex-wife had told him that to him was nitpicking at the time, he had come to realize was a truth. And he changed his life, moved away from his parents after he got away from them, got himself good job, got himself back on track, and very much wanted to see his children who hadn't seen him in years. Well, I said to him, approach tenderly take your time just send a card and say i often thought of you day in day out but i stayed away for your growth and your purpose in life and if you'd like to see me i'm available 
here's my phone number. Well, he soon got a call from his daughter and she came to visit and guess what she was saying? Mum's always nitpicky. <laughs> Mum hadn't changed. And she was thinking about leaving Mum to come and live with Dad, a man that she had not seen in 15 years. Well, what followed was conversations on the phone and little by little she realised that her dad had a lot of input that was quite good for her. So she was using some of the things that he said. He'd still stayed away from home and she'd gone back to home. And now she's dealing with her mother nitpicking her because she sounds like her father because she knew she'd been with her father, didn't keep any secrets. So the nitpicking got worse. So eventually she said, I'm leaving home, I'm moving out of home. Well, again, I didn't hear from either of them for a long time. And out of the blue, she called me and said, could she have a session? And when I talked to her about her session, we found out that she was in a relationship where she was nitpicking her boyfriend. So you can see how things, ways and means of habits are passed down from generation to generation through the different actions that we take in trying to be with someone. And the mindsets that we've learned from our childhood that are, shall we say, drilled into our brain box to be the way we're supposed to think. And so we set ourselves up with the Prince Charming Princess scenario expecting that he or she will fit in nicely to our home, our family, and that everything will get along nicely. What well, does that ring bells with you? Are you a divorcee? Are you someone that's separated but you, your children are going between you and your husband and you find out that when they come back from being with dad they're either misbehaving because they're playing up, testing you or they're saying they didn't have a good time with dad's family because it was all different from what was at home and I don't want to go again. All these things are pressured belief systems that are founded on assumption. You cannot know a person if they're not sharing on a deep level. And I've noticed over the years of being a medium counselor, you know, psychological issues, dealing with the mentally insane and so on, I found that 90% of the people's traumas has originally begun with assuming that they are right or that they will never be loved. So if I'm speaking to you and you're in a situation where you really feel that you are right, I'm asking you to step back and say to yourself, am I really right? Or am I just mouthing my points of view so that I get control over my kids, my husband, my wife, whatever it is, and my life, okay? If you are, you're rationalizing, you're explaining, you're excusing, you're remembering all the history that has happened throughout your life. And as your mind consciously goes over it all, you will have a string of emotions that will tear you down into a negative point of view on how you see yourself in your relationships with all the people you've ever met. Self-esteem, self-worth, and self-value end up on the floor. You are then forced to explain yourself to everyone because you feel if they don't understand you, if they don't know you, you better explain even more. I have to admit that I did a lot of that in my youth and it up to about 40 when I clinically died. When I came back having promised my spirit guides that I would stay and do the work I'd come to do, which I had no idea what it was at the time beyond being a medium, um, you know, I, I had to take a long look at myself and say, 
I've become, I've modelled, if you like, in like a piece of clay into being the person I was, which was running around in circles, taking everybody wherever they needed to go so that they'd feel safe, whether it was children or clients, being called out as a minister in the middle of the night because so-and-so's drunk and in ER, uh, or going to the police and, and speaking up for someone who's uh, a minor uh, and shouldn't be drinking or something like that. So my life was very busy. Plus, my own children were a big handful uh, because their fathers were not good role models. And so I had a mess on my hand. And here I am, a counsellor and doing all the right things, so I thought, for everyone. But what I actually was, was a nagging bitch, because I'm yelling at my four kids who I can't handle because they're all very dominant, aggressive personalities. Uh, and I'm also dealing with a uh, parent's father uh, in cases, I won't bore you with all my history, but who were not being the father they should be. And so um, I was like mother and father at the same time. And yes, it broke me. I ended up dying and being alive again to carry on in a different way. But did people know that I was different? Were they still colouring me with the same history of my past? Well, the truth is, yes, they were. So my patients and people were still expecting me to come out at all hours of the day and help them. They were still expecting me to drop whatever I was doing and give them their sessions, whether it was healing or counselling or hypnosis or whatever it was they needed, and readings, connections with spirit guides, wanting to know what they could do to make their life better. A lot of the information that I was often giving was advice for me too. Out of my mouth came the wisdom Spirit wanted me to say to them, but I was hearing it from me too. And because I like to grow and evolve, I made it a point to adapt throughout my life. And even now today, you know, if I go back into my history to my family and the way that they were, they will still bring up themes about how I was. And it is hurtful in its own way, but it's a reminder, don't do it again. So I don't ask my kids, what are you doing? And then immediately say, well, you should do this. And did you check this? And did you check that? I just say, oh, what happens? How do you do that? Is it interesting? Do you like it? Oh, I'm so happy for you. That's how I like to talk with them now. But if I say one word wrong, like an old word, it's a key button pusher and I watch it happen and I know it's happening and I know it's going to happen if I use that keyword. And I want you as a family member in your family to realize we all have keywords that set us off. Mine was you always, <laughs> I mentioned that earlier, because when you're telling someone they're always drunk, they don't want to hear that. Okay, or you're always lying to me. They don't want to hear that. And I must admit, even with my wonderful Stephen Van Coots, my dear husband that passed only uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I would say to him when he's sick or ill, there it was in the beginning. I was still saying it because I come from the other marriage. And I was saying, you always put yourself down. Don't do that. Because I was trying to help him raise himself up. And it wasn't long before he jumped on the fact that I was saying, you always. And so I had to learn to not say that. But you know, it's difficult when someone's ill and they're asking for help and you're trying to give it and someone's saying, well, I'm not into that. You tend to slip back into your past. I slipped right back into my mother who was a cripple and my father is studying with post-traumatic stress disorder and there I heard it. They always were saying, you always. Another word that was a key word for me was actually. When someone asked me if I was doing something or other and they were wrong, I would say, well, actually, I'm doing something differently. And then they say, well, what are you doing differently? And I say, what well, I'm doing. And they say, well, yeah, that's just crazy. And they start judging me. And that was upsetting for me 
I want you please if you're one of those people to realize that not everybody gets what you're doing especially if you're in the metaphysical world because people are still very steeped in their religions and their philosophies and the old traditions of the Piscean Age where it is get, own, conquer and keep and block out anyone else who would try and take what you have away from you. Well, I'm happy to say, as I've said in my other shows, that now we're in the Aquarian Age, that we have to learn to listen. But how do we listen to someone who is critiquing us, demoralizing us, making us feel little and little every day till we're lying on the bed or the sofa, sobbing in absolute depression, dismay, disillusion, uh, feeling that nobody in the family absolutely is interested in who you are and what you're doing. Well, I can tell you that when I went over to Japan in 86 and worked there for a while, I was seeing the American culture, the Western culture, mixed with the old Japanese history cultures. And it was very difficult to help someone to understand that they don't have to have an arranged marriage because that was the thing in those days. Today, oh, thank goodness, they are able to find the person and fall in love, but they still are guided by the traditions such as you have to work hard and save a lot of money first before you can get married or you have to go out and about and enjoy yourself and do all the things that you want to do before you get married because once you get married you're going to follow the old traditions, the Japanese traditions that you're going to build a business and you're going to tell your son or daughter when they grow up they're going to carry on the business and uh, when the wife has produced her two babies her husband might go off and have an affair and have a mistress and she accepts it because back in the old days Back in old Japan, it was okay for the husband to have concubines, as many women as he wanted. Now, if you're in India, and uh, there the, uh, shall we say you're Hindu, then if your husband's are beating you and abusing you, it's part of karma and you're supposed to take it and put up with it. Because the man is supposed to show that he's strong and powerful. Well, fortunately, they too have got westernized now. And so marriages are not so arranged and uh, people are having more awareness of mixing the cultures. When I was there back in 79, it was uh, don't interfere if there's a car accident and people are l lolling out of the car looking like they're about to die, don't help. I had loads of doctors and people on my tour and we were not allowed to stop and help because that was the way people thought. If it's your time to die, you're going to die. If they're meant to be saved, someone who is their nurse or doctor will turn up and save them. So you can see just by these few examples that the world generally had all their cultures, their points of view during the Piscean Age of how they expect their partner to behave and follow tradition. But something happened to us with the world wars with Crimea before that and later with Vietnam the people started to realize that you could fall in love with someone who is not of your culture who is not of your race and who is so different that it felt like you were escaping from the habits and routines of your life only to find that you stepped into something worse here's an example of a wonderful girl I had as a friend. I'll just name her because I don't know where she is and there are many in, with this name, Wendy. Wendy had a relationship that was abusive and I'd witnessed that. And I asked her why she was in it. Well, eventually she had enough strength to break that up. I'd stopped nursing and gone into the psychology and marriage and things like that. So I wanted to see her again. I went to visit her at the hospital only to find that she'd left and she'd married uh, an Arab of some country, I don't know which country, and he'd taken her to his country and her family had disowned her 
from marrying a foreigner. Years went by, my sister Melinda Briar Briggs in England is a medium too. And I was visiting and she decided she wanted to give me a reading. I said, yeah, you love that. And out of the blue, she just throws at me, you know your friend Wendy? I said, yeah. She said, I see her sitting on the sand in a foreign country with two children, very, very miserable, beaten, unhappy, and can't get home. Well, that was what the uh, Arabs were doing from different countries. They were taking British women back to their culture and their culture locks the women down. The only place a woman has any say is in the home. Outside, she has to cover herself. She can't be free. Can you imagine what it's like being a Westerner, suddenly having to walk with your face covered up, can't talk to anyone, especially men? It must be hell. So why would you run off into the arms of a foreigner who's Prince Charming without knowing his culture, without knowing his philosophy, his religion. Why would you rush into something before you really truly know this person? Was it because he was kind and gentle in the dating and you've had sex and you're pregnant? Does that really mean in today's culture that you have to give up your life as a woman and be something they want you to be on the other side of the fence if you're a foreigner and you're a man and you've come over here and you found your princess are you ready to put down your history your ancestry and live an american style life it's very difficult i'm british and i came over here in 1982 first thing i noticed was all the streets were enormous and the buildings too tall the second thing I noticed was that because I was British and had a British accent, everybody loved it. And I thought, why? You know, I'm, I'm used to my British speech. But you know, when the Americans go over to Britain, they too love the American accent. So yes, we're kind of romanticized with a foreigner's voice, their vibration. And we assume as they're putting on their best face, not their angry face, that this is the loving Prince Charming or Princess we we're looking for. And then we rush into marriage. Ugh. Bringing the family together. Nobody knows anyone. They're all trying to smile sweetly and say this is a wonderful marriage. But secretly they're all thinking, mixed marriages, mixed relationships. How's this going to work? We're brought up to the Piscean age. You know, we don't mix cultures. We have to stay in the same religion. So they're already intonating to a couple the minute they marry that they're going to have a hard time settling down. And they'll say it subtly, but the inference is there. And the inference can do more damage and harm than actually the assumption because the imagination kicks in. Oh, they said that we're going to have a lot of hard work. What they were really saying is they don't accept that he's black and I'm white. Just to use one example. Or, you know, I saw this one happen. Um, they, they got married uh, in a temple uh, for a Hindu temple thing. Uh, not, not a, not a uh, Jewish temple. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it was like, we're having this and we're having that, and this is a temple to some god I can't remember. And I remember listening to the people in the background saying, who is this god? I've never heard this god. It's not like Jesus or Buddha or, or you know, some other one they were mentioning. I mentioned it, Muhammad and so on. But it, it was like, what does it matter? These two people love one another. And then I heard from someone else, well, they only met one another two weeks ago. And me being that I was a divorcee, I'm sitting there thinking, i got to bite my lip. I can't say a thing. This is their wedding day. This is their choice. They're not my religion. Even though I embrace the religious philosophy of India, I am not saying a word. That was my decision. So I'm looking at monkeys and things, 
and the newly married woman comes up to me and she says can you see my future for me <laughs> I had to really do the thing that should be done and say you will be fine you'll have to listen to one another and you need to study your religion so you both understand where you're coming from other than that you should be fine she was happy with that and that's the kind of thing family should do they should only say if the couple asks what do you think I should work on and when you give that opinion give it in an open book way so that they can choose how they hear it rather than you must do this and you should do this and you ought to do this and don't uh, ever do that and that and that and this and this it's a put down before you even start and married couples do that all the time and parents of the married couples do that all the time and the poor kids are exposed to all this now the kids if they're we talk about now bring it up to date they're born in the Aquarian age and they're psychic so they can see your aura and they can see when you're upset when you're putting on a smiley face they know when you're angry well actually all children know that for the first five years of their life anyway. I know that I was very psychic as a child and I could read my parents like a book. And I still can. Well, mind you, they're past now, but, you know, I still can know what they were feeling or thinking. I didn't forget it. But it was a good tool. It was a good way for me to learn that I don't want to be like my parents. As proud as I am of my hereditary backlog of ancestors I have a lot of them um, it was uh, rubbed down my throat that I should honour them and, and uh, act like them and live up to them and live the British style I didn't want to I didn't I embraced all religions I went to every church, synagogue uh, temple, whatever I could find in England when I was 12 I wanted to know what they were talking about Especially when my best friend told me that they go to confession in the Catholic Church and lie, break up stuff, that they were sinners. That's not good, is it? How many of you listening have found yourself lying to avoid telling the truth about something that's important to you? Like saying, when someone says, what's up? You go, oh, nothing, I'm all right, I'm all right, and hide it. Well... You're not hiding it because your face is showing it. Your eyes are showing your misery. Your way you hide your head, the way you walk, your body language, it's all saying, I'm unhappy. So, you know, even if you're in a marriage and, and husband walks in the door and you're sitting there like a long face so-and-so about the washer went wrong, that's not a nice greeting for someone who's been at work all day, maybe had his boss tell him, you know, you, you won't have this job much longer unless you bring in more money and stuff. Blaming and shaming is a very bad thing that goes on in many marriages. It's all your fault I'm unhappy. You're not bringing me home enough money. It's all your fault I cooked this dinner hours ago. You didn't call me and tell me where you were and now the dinner's ruined and I'm starving because I was waiting for you and I haven't eaten just to give you a couple of things that I said years ago <laughs> okay no I haven't forgotten because I realized after I'd said all these things I would go upstairs and cry because I was a monster and I hated being a monster and I didn't want to be a monster which led me to get out of being a married woman so independence came for us women in the 80s it started there we started to get help with pregnancies, we started to get help with children in kindergarten, but it took another 20 years for the, the countries in general in the Western world to realize the importance of women in marriages and the importance of men in marriages. We are equal. We stand side by side. We're not living a role anymore like in the 1800s father's role is go to work and read the newspaper when he comes home 
mother's job is to cook all day and feed the kids and put them to bed and then in the evening we sit by the fire and discuss our days probably a pretty boring conversation right today we come home oh i had so and so and this happened and that happened and rah, rah, rah. and then the other one yeah but while that was going on i had this and that and this and that and you're so busy sharing all your terrible stuff that by the time you've got through that you are both depressed and the kids come in and do one thing and yell and scream at them or uh, you know go on your bed you're punished you dropped something on the floor or whatever it is I suggest that when you come home you say something good that happened in your day hi honey I'm home I had a good day, day today at work with a nice meal with so-and-so oh what were you doing with so-and-so i didn't have a nice meal with so-and-so uh you you should watch the money blah 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 says wife not good critiquing putting down his nice happy moment is going to make him shout back what you need to say is i'm glad you had a nice lunch um what else happened oh nothing much okay you now know he really didn't have a good day Okay, he's going to turn around and ask you, how was your day? Well, the washing got done. That was great. But I've still got A, B and C. But I'll get it done later. And he'll say, what any help? Whole different dialogue, you see. So I'm saying to you, think before you speak. Okay, I didn't when I was a young woman. I'm direct. I was taught by my parents to be direct and say a snowball is a snowball. It's ball. So you don't want to cover it up and hence you come out with the truth. But you don't give all the details. Because upper class people, <laughs> snobbery people, don't tell people their business. Well, I was the opposite. Okay, come in the door. How was your day? Well, the washing machine blew up and then the kids broke this and that happened and this happened. I need you to fix it all, please, now, because I can't do something. Oh, well, I'm going out right now. I've got a truck stop to do. I've got to go and rescue a truck, so I've just popped in to bring you ABC. Thank you. How, when will you be back? Oh, it shouldn't be long, two hours. Seven hours later, he comes in the door rolling drunk. He's run away from me. He hasn't gone to get a truck and save it. He's in the pub. I learned that after a year or two. I was so stupid, okay? But I now have to take responsibility for the fact that I drove him out of the house by going on about everything was not manageable here, including him. So, you see, we have to realize that if we make our bed, we don't have to lie on it. And that was my next step. I had to realize that I needed to get out of this situation. But I didn't want a divorce. I didn't want to be married again. So I thought a separation would do. Well, it did for a while. And what I found was subterfuge. Kids would go with dad. Dad would take them to work or, or somewhere or take them to see a new girlfriend and then tell them that they never went to see the girlfriend and don't tell me because it doesn't want trouble. And so they come home and I say, how did you, they go, oh, nothing, we just went to work. Well, it was a while later I found out that they were lying. I was angry, not for them, but for the ex for making the lie. But he was a lie. So you see copycatting goes on and I'm not saying my children lie today they're great but they can lie to themselves they can rationalize those years they can see them from different points of view because they are encoded with different DNA from me They've got some of their dad in them so they agree part with me and they agree part with him that's going to be inevitable because generation after generation have handed down the DNA of their ancestors. And it's there for a reason, so that we do follow a line of growth from that family, always evolving, getting better and better as we go. And now I like to think I've grown quite a bit and I'm a teacher and a professor and I do all the things that I knew I was gonna do when I was a child. 
and yes my healing hands you can see them I'm going to show you this I did it on another video I'm now closed down but I am that you can see the pink areas here and here I'm now going to open up a little bit more and you'll see them get darker my hands are tingling right now and if you're watching this I want you to just associate with my hands put your hands up with mine and you see if you can feel your hands tingling opposite my hands and I know that you will feel something it may be warmth it may be tingling you may see your hands get ready red or they may just stay pink because you're not ready to trust yourself to feel with your hands but think about these hands all day long they're picking up things putting things down writing typing washing up just name a few things see how red this is here now okay so if I put my hands together I'm making my energy stronger okay much stronger now see how darker this is now okay if I keep doing that so why am I showing you this I want you to understand that you can receive healing through the computer by allowing yourself to hold your hands up from me now how's it getting to you is it going along the wire through the ground no what's happening is my spirit guides are connecting with you as you connect with me we create a circle and even if I'm not there in real time it's still happening for you in your world and as we create this circle between me and the spirit guides you receive the holy host healing okay now just imagine if you sat down and thought about that before your husband or your wife comes home and got yourself in a healed moment of peace so that when they walk in the door you're saying oh darling you look tired would you like a cup of this or that um, I've got something for you uh, or you know shall we go out and eat whatever it is you want and later after you've calmed down and you've both got used to being together for a bit whatever you've been doing eating whatever it is then you say how was your day well, it wasn't too good. I don't really want to talk about it. Okay. Well, how was your day? Well, actually, my day was pretty good for once. I did get everything done, and the washing machine didn't break this time. So I, I'm, I'm ready f to relax. Okay. Okay. Um, well, do you want to talk about anything at work? Well, not really, but you can tell he does. So you say something like, well, I'm here if you want to talk about it. Uh, and, and of course eventually he will because you're not pushing and that works both ways okay I just use a male female as a model but you can flip it and if you have this awareness of listening and looking and watching and noting you will know instinctively if it's a wrong time to bring up one of your issues or to blame and shame in some way that makes them even more irritable be sensitive to your instincts if you don't know what your instinct is know that it's your psyche undeveloped that feeling that you don't know what you're feeling but you know it's a bad feeling or, or a good feeling relative to the situation and then uh, act accordingly to it so if you feel it's a bad feeling when he says oh you know it wasn't a good day at work don't get it out of him right then and there just say okay well let's have a nice meal maybe you want to talk about it later you're not a threat then you're not going to pull up history and then bite on it when you don't like what you hear coming out of his mouth you've had time to calm down before he came home you've given yourself a bit of healing with your hands you put them on your body your heart in your solar plexus your base shark wherever you want you can even put it on your head if you want to cool your brain down and stop thinking you are your own healer and you are your own mentor 
and you are your own emotional supporter. I had to learn that and I learned it the hard way through the marriages and being out there in the public eye for so many years and going to so many different countries teaching and hearing their philosophies and theologies and spirituality. It was inevitable that I was going to understand and become the person I am today. So that said, um, I hope that you'll think twice about attacking someone that you love and blaming and shaming them. I hope you'll take to heart some of the positive ways of dealing with stress in a marriage or any relationship at work or friends. I've seen friends even break up over silly quarrels. Step back, ask yourself, is having a quarrel worth the loss of a friendship? Is blaming and shaming someone into feeling so low and miserable that I've destroyed a marriage? Whatever it is in some way, you need to take your share of the blame. You need to take your share of the parts in the performance of the relationship. That's a big step. Admitting that you're out of step, that you're guilty, that you lost or that you didn't win and your emotional negativity is, poor me, I didn't win, I've still got to go over it again, 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 again. No, dump it. Tell yourself, obviously I got nowhere with this because this is not a good uh, way I'm dealing with it. Cool down, go away, think it through, and when you're ready, come back and come back cool, calm, serene, loving and supportive. If you come back expecting him or her to uh, respond to this cool, loving, calm you, they may be sitting there worried out of their mind where you are because you've run out of the house uh, and not had any time to think about what was said and what was done. So they're musing over that for the next day or two because you've done a drama that has caused that person anguish, even more umbrage maybe, leaving them not knowing where you are. A lot of people, when they get sad, miserable, want to run away, and they do. But really, what are you doing? You're harming yourself if you run away because you're leaving something undone. And when you leave something undone, it picks at you constantly, all the time. And it builds and it builds and it builds until you're so outraged, so angry that you say all these things that you would never have said otherwise. And throwing stones mentally and emotionally leads to violence. And, you know, when you're that angry, and I know about being that angry, believe you me, it takes a lot of courage to not hit out to not do damage to the person who's arguing with you. And after all, if you do damage someone, you're the one who's going to suffer later because you will be arrested, locked up, and nobody will give a damn about it because they'll see you as a monster. And yes, there are women who are just as violent. You don't want to go down that pathway, do you? You don't want to become someone who's done violence to another person. It's only your internal belief system, your conscious mind, that goes over and over memories that makes you become angry and violent. You have the freedom of choice to choose to see things differently. And I did that. I admit I had the help of my spirit guides but without that, I still would have found a different way because I'd studied too much psychology and theology to ignore it. I knew that I was a screaming, nagging bitch, and I admitted. And I admitted it then. I even said I was in those days. But I'm not that person anymore because I saw it. I didn't like me. I didn't want to be like me. I didn't want to be in these situations where I was constantly yelling and screaming at everyone who was just 
running around doing whatever they wanted to do and you have four boisterous boys who are very dominant very independent who would not do what they were told it's inevitable that you're going to find yourself wishing that you had someone close to you well i was fortunate now i had some older women who came and went in my house who'd come and sit and chat and i could moan and groan a bit to them and get it off my chest to someone it does help to talk to someone so but not to the person you want to blame and shame so if you need a counselor someone like me or you need a church padre or something or you know go to the synagogue or the temple and find the priest there then do it because they are that's their job to listen to you and to help you okay but if you're into metaphysical studies then you're going to have a hard time uh, getting a regular church or whatever you know religion you are uh, person to give you the advice uh, that you would need metaphysically because they don't go there and I actually when I was 12 and I said I was going to different places to ask questions about religions and stuff because by the way there weren't any metaphysical books in libraries in those days in England um, what I basically uh, was searching for was answers to my psychic ability because everybody I met said oh you're a blessed child you have a gift and you're a wonderful healer and you, your messages are proof of survival of life after death they're wonderful too and we don't know how you do it so we'll just acknowledge and praise you and then next breath tell you well you're just a kid and what do you know so it was like being hit round the cheek, you know, uh, when you've done something wrong. It's slap in the face. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for what you've done for me, but hey, I don't believe you. <laughs> it, it was really silly, but, you know, I got confused. I didn't know whether I, I got to be afraid that I couldn't go up once I got to four years old, five years old. I wasn't so brave to run up to a stranger and give him a message. You know, I, I would hold back because I've been told strangers could hurt me and and uh, you know take and carry me off with sweeties and never see mommy and daddy again kind of thing so yeah I, I was afraid to approach people yet I still had spirit in my head saying go tell that person that their uncle Alan is doing well in the spirit world okay he would take one now and bite him in the nails and go, go up and do something and somehow spirit guides always seem to make these people dawdle or hang, hang around on the street or something and I kind of walk up excuse me um, I got a message from your uncle Alan he's wonderful in the spirit world and I'd run away <laughs> and then they, they wait 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 who, who are you you know that's how I was giving messages as a child and by the time I got into high school I was already victimized for being different and so all my friends were the people who were victimized the birds of a feather flock together so why am I saying this because I want you to realize that a lot of people get married or live together running away from home without facing it all and coming to I am all that I am and I'm going to be the person I want to be, not the person my parents and grandparents are modeling to be. Okay, because their history, they're out of date. So this new age, the Aquarian age, as I said so many times about listening, is to be able to say to someone, I saw you had an incident that's worrying you. When you'd like to talk about it, I'm here for you. And what they want to do is talk. They want to say, he said and she said, and this happened and that happened, and nobody cared, and da 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 da. You want to get it off their chest. And if you're the partner that loves them and cares about them in some way, sitting there in front of them, you will guess, okay, that's what wonderful. Oh, really? What happened next? You know, and you draw it out of them so that they get it off their chest now when you say get it off the chest what you're saying is you're getting it out of the heart because it's the heart that's hurting 
You have to remember we have a long conscious memory, but we only have it if the heart is hurting. So if I said to someone, your hair looks terrible, and that person doesn't give a damn about what I say logically, they'll just look at me and think she's weird and walk away and never think about their hair looks awful. But if I said that to my sister, she will go look in the mirror and say, what do you mean? Where? where? What? What's wrong? I, I think it's all right, right? Well, of course, I wouldn't do that to her because I'm tactful. I'd say, wow, you've got new hairdo. <laughs> you know? And then she'd say, yeah, I like it. Do you think? I'd say, yeah, it's, it's good. But I'm not saying, wow, it's the greatest thing since I've seen you looking because I might have an opinion that I think she would look better somehow, okay? We all have better somehows in our mind but we have to ask ourselves is that suitable at this time to actually say these words because if this person is not receptive it's going to hurt them and when they're hurt they're going to hurt you back so you're really protecting yourself when you think about what you're going to say before you speak is self-preservation. I'm sure you want more happy families and happy friends than unhappy ones. Yes, many people run away from home. But what I'm concerned about is the children. Children are, uh, I know some people ran away from home at nine and never went back and survived on the streets. I know people that were older teenagers who also ran on the streets and did a lot of things um, and I was still a teenager myself and I'm trying to tell them you've got to go home to your family you know you can't survive on the street and I see them maybe a month later or looking all dirty and grubby and I say haven't you gone home yet and they say no and I list why they should go home I can't I can't go home my father will beat me if I go home my mother will never forgive me I didn't have enough knowledge as a teenager to say don't you realize that when you walk in the door your parents are going to break down and cry because they realize you're not dead but don't you realize too that when you ran away, you ran away from your selfish needs of I want what I want when I want it. And my parents aren't giving it to me. So I play up. And as a result of playing up, they've hit me and beaten me up. You've got to see your part in the role in a family. I'm going to be doing a lot of talks on families. We're going to do classes on teaching people how to interact in families. And I hope that you've heard enough from me today where you're beginning to realize that there is always another side to the story. Now, if you'd like to have counseling with me, all you have to do is write to me, P-R-O-F, short for professor, and then Margaret, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T, and then RVC for Rogers Van Coops, just the initials, at gmail.com. Put in the message center at the top, I need a reading or counseling or help, please. Put something that really tells me what you want uh, with me, simply put, because I am spammed morning, noon and night with hundreds of emails. And thank goodness I have someone who takes care of that for me. But I will know and I will contact you. So make sure you put your email and phone number. Now, if you'd like to study with me and Dr. Katie Kamara, congratulations, she just got a doctorate. Uh, we have a show, uh, Dr. Margaret and uh, Dr. Katie Speaks on Saturdays where we address issues and then it's shared on Facebook. So. Um, if you look for it, you might miss the live shows, but you can certainly listen uh, in your own time on Facebook. And of course, Katie shares it all other places as well. So um, she's very good at that. I'm, I'm silly. I can't do all that. Thank goodness for Katie in my life. She's wonderful. And you'll find her wonderful too. So 
Uh, then we've got, she's building the websites, they're up, but we're still amending them. Easy Peasy, that's spelled the same as easy, P-E-A-S-Y, Easy Peasy Solutions dot org. Go there, sign in, put your name, put your phone number, put your uh, email so we can get hold of you, and uh, then put in the box what you're interested in, what you would like. Do you want counselling? Do you want coaching? Those kinds of things privately, or do you want to study? Do you want to get certificates in the study? Do you want to get diplomas so you can change your career and, and become a counsellor or something? I'm here to teach you, but I'm also looking for other teachers who are looking for a platform where they can teach their things. So if you're a teacher listening to this and you have some good qualifications, we'd like to hear from you. So go to the same site, Easy Peasy Solutions, and put in there that you'd like to teach and put us a topic. Don't say any more. We'll contact you with your phone number and chat, okay? Now, if um, you're wanting to, you already know you want certification, diplomas in topics, then go to Sumaris, S-U-M-A-R-I-S, that's S for sugar, both ends of the word, Sumaris Education, spelled out, Center, spelled out American, Dot com. There you can sign in again, put your name, details, and tell us what the topic is that you'd like to qualify to be studied in. Um, sometimes we can do one-on-one -on -one if there's not enough. Uh, sometimes we'll do group classes. We have to see how that unfolds. Those classes in the beginning, so you get an idea of what we're doing, will be free. But given time, they will be in keeping with learning online. We are not looking to sell you a class and then pitch to you that you have to buy this program and that program. This is going to be a proper school online and we're working to get that all legally done but first we have to get all the sites running and working well. Thanks to Katie, she's doing that. So um, that is one of the things that you might want to think about uh, what, what you would like to study with us. Uh, we've got a list of different things in there, but we haven't put up all the classes yet. If you're wanting to become a minister, uh, and by that I mean a, a minister practitioner where you want to do counselling for people at church or you know, at work or something like that, um, th that is training you with your psychic ability, but from a different angle and a different point of view, there's a, a one-year and a two-year course. If you do the one-year, you'll become a counsellor under the Spiritist Church. And if you're wanting to be a minister who has your own church and your own charter and do services, uh, which a lot of people did with spiritualism, then under that we can ordain you as a practitioner. Okay, But it's a, it's a lot of study. You don't just get it in five minutes. It takes you a couple of years. Okay, at the standards that we set. Because you have to remember, if you're going to be teaching the young ones of the future, you have to know your psychic ability, you have to be able to recognize it in them, and you have to be able to acknowledge that you can counsel those kinds of people who are having a lot of spiritual issues, such as feeling there's a negative spirit in their room, or uh, that someone's put a curse on them or something. So we cover that side of it, but if you want to become a, a psychic, healer, therapist, medium, then you go back to Samaris Education Centre, where there's lots of courses to do on that. Okay, now, if uh, you want to see uh, anything more about Katie, go to... Um, I always have to think, because I haven't still got it in my head, I'm sorry, Katie. Soma uh, Media... Is that right? So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Katie. I I will put it underneath because she's got so many titles and things under uh, Soma Fusion Media. That's it. SomaFusionMedia.com. That's her main place that you can go. And if you're a person that wants to teach, you could go there and talk to her through that. That and she has uh, her radio station. So um, she's a very busy lady, uh, and a lot of people are reaching out to her right now. So 
only contact her if you're really wanting to talk to her uh, and uh, do watch her show um, she goes out on Wednesday nights uh, 7 Eastern um, and uh, it's Soma Fusion Media just I think that's all it is actually I'm not sure <laughs> Bought me. I should have known I should have done research see so there's always something we fail on and we always forget something uh, especially when you get older I had I turned 79 today as I said earlier I can't believe it but there we are and uh, the, the bottom line is yeah my brain I miss words now and again but when I'm working with spirit I am hot to try I, I just know everything I need to know so do look up Katie Kamara on Facebook follow her do look up me follow me on Facebook uh, and we will put messages up there of all the shows that we do so you'll be able to see mine you'll be able to see hers and you'll see ours and other people that she also airs for mm -hmm. so you're not alone there's lots of information that you can reach out once you follow us and join with us and become interested in all the things that you are interested in to a point where you decide you really want to take it seriously and study then we'll be there for you so on that note as i said earlier if you need my help and guidance or katie's help and guidance you know listen to all our shows it's a lot for free and then uh if you want to be with us one-on-one -on -one, we can help you so on that note, I'm going to stop this recording. <laughs>